Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much to uh, Middle East Monitor for organising this event. Arthur James Balfour enabled the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Through his 1917 declaration, Britain became the Zionist movement's most powerful sponsor. The British government did so knowing full well that the colonisation of Palestine posed an enormous threat to its indigenous people. The British government was not bothered about that threat. It regarded Palestinians as expendable. As Balfour himself would state a few years after his declaration, Britain attached greater importance to Zionist aspirations than to the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. Britain's support for the Zionist movement soon had a discernible impact. The League of Nations mandate, under which Britain ruled Palestine between the two world wars, contained an explicit commitment to nurture Zionist colonisation. The Balfour Declaration was in effect copied and pasted into that mandate. In 1920, Herbert Samuel became the first British High Commissioner for Palestine. Herbert Samuel was a staunch Zionist and his appointment caused consternation among many Palestinians. The Palestinians were right to be concerned. Herbert Samuel introduced measures to allow acquisition by the Zionist movement of land on which Palestinians had lived and farmed for generations. Entire villages in the Galilee region were bought up by Zionist colonisers and when the people living in these villages refused to be moved, Herbert Samuel's administration overruled their objections. Large-scale evictions were thereby given the green light. Understandably, the British and their allies in the Zionist movement encountered much resistance. During the 1930s, a major Palestinian revolt broke out. The British responded to that revolt with great brutality. On the pretext of urban renewal, the British demolished the old city of Jaffa, leaving its residents homeless. That was one of many instances in which communities were punished collectively for refusing to obey their oppressors. Bernard Montgomery, a very famous military commander, instituted a shoot-to-kill policy during this period. period. According to Montgomery's order, anyone who assisted a rebel should be treated as a rebel. Such broad guidance gave British soldiers carte blanche to terrorise Palestinians with impunity. While crushing the 1930s revolt, Britain recruited members of the Haganah, the largest Zionist militia in Palestine at the time. This meant that Britain trained many of the Zionist forces that would expel around 750,000 Palestinians from their homes the following decade. Through such collaboration, Britain laid the groundwork for the Nakba, the catastrophe that befell Palestinians in 1948. 
Although Britain had decided to relinquish its mandate in that year, it was still in charge when the Nakba began. The British reneged on their legal and moral obligation to protect Palestinians from harm. Hugh Stockwell was a British general stationed in the Haifa area, and British military archives show that he knew in advance of Zionist plans to attack that city. After refusing to aid Palestinians who came under fire, Hugh Stockwell ordered them to leave Haifa. His behaviour was callous. It was also logical. The Zionist project was premised on the expulsion of Palestinians. That project was given an important push by Balfour in 1917. Push came to shove just over three decades later. The Palestinians were shoved out en masse as the State of Israel was established. Britain has colluded with Israel for most of that state's history. Approved by Harold Wilson's government, hundreds of battle tanks were exported from Britain to Israel in advance of the June 1967 war. And those tanks proved to be essential in that, in the, in that Israeli offensive, something that caused considerable pleasure for British diplomats in Tel Aviv. This means that the an ongoing occupation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Gaza and the Golan Heights, was facilitated by cabinet ministers here in London. Having armed Israel at cru crucial junctures, Britain is now a valued client of the Israeli weapons industry. Just a few weeks ago, Elbit Systems, one of the largest Israeli weapons companies, stated that it wished to view Britain as an actual home market. Elbit has at least five subsidiaries in this country. Meanwhile, the largest military drone program in Europe has been commissioned by the British Army. Known as Watchkeeper, it is based on Israeli-designed killing machines that have been tested out against men, women and children in Gaza. Both the Labour Party and the Conservatives have representatives within them who parrot Israeli propaganda at every available opportunity. At the Tories conference just this week, Michael Gove called Israel, and I quote, a truly miraculous nation and a light unto the world. <laughs> Michael Gove's choice of words was despicable. The state he described as a light unto the world has plunged Gaza into darkness by severely limiting the supply of electricity. The same light unto the world recently stole solar panels from a nursery school in the occupied West Bank. That was a crime against children, it was a crime against the right to education, it was a crime against sustainable energy. Yet for some reason, it did not distress Britain's current environment secretary, the aforementioned Michael Gove. Arthur Balfour had an aversion to boycotts. When he headed the British administration in Ireland during the late 19th century, Balfour proposed that the boycotting of landlords should be punishable by up to six months hard labour. And interestingly, the origin of the term boycott has been traced to Ireland in that period. The term got its name from Charles Boycott, a land agent based in County Mayo. Charles Boycott found that his employees 
refused to cooperate with him after he served a series of eviction notices. My friends, boycotts can be a powerful tool to demand justice for an entire for excuse me boycotts can be a powerful tool to demand justice for an oppressed people and it is only fitting that the palestinians the very people whom arthur balfour regarded as expendable are harnessing the power of boycotts in their struggle for justice and equality the least the rest of us can do is support is to support that struggle by boycotting and isolating Israel. Let us take delight, my friends, in using a tactic that Arthur Balfour tried to ban. Thank you very much. Yeah.